And once again, if I missed you at the very beginning, my name is Pastor Justin, I'm the pastor here at Grace Hill. It's wonderful to have you with us. Happy Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Today is one of the most important days in the church year, and it is the day that we celebrate that there is an empty tomb. It is the day that we celebrate that Jesus rose from the dead three days later, just like he predicted, and that there is no body to be worshipped, that he is alive. And see, the foundation of Christianity, it's not faith or hope, it is, it is a, a faith-centered in an actual historical event that nobody can explain. Because this is the miraculous message of Easter that every great leader the world has ever seen, you can go and visit the place where their body lays. But there is no doubt every, not just the Bible, the, the, the Romans, the Greeks, every historical document testifies that a man named Jesus of Lazar, or Nazareth lived, that he was a real person, and that he was put to death by the Romans. That is found through historical documents everywhere. And yet, you cannot find his body today. And that his death and his missing body and his resurrection and those claiming to have seen him, which hundreds of people did, that it changed the whole world. It changed everything. And see, I can admit as a pastor that there are parts of our faith that are hard to understand. There are parts of the Bible that you just step back and go, I don't know about that. But what you always have to come back to is this. What about the empty tomb? One empty tomb in the city of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, and it still revolutionizes the world. You have to answer for that. That even through your doubts, you have to have some type of understanding of what took place there. And so what do you do with the empty tomb? Because this is the radical explanation here, is if the tomb is empty, anything is possible. If a man can come to earth and claim to be the son of God, and then when he is brutally murdered for thousands of people to witness, and then when he rises from the dead and hundreds and thousands of people see him after his death, then anything is possible. And see, my big question for us today is this. This was not a mystery. Jesus told all of his followers for months and months before he died that he would be arrested, he would be beaten, that he would be put in a tomb, and that three days later he would rise. And so here's my big question. Sunday morning, why was nobody there to watch? Isn't it odd? Not one person stepped back and said, I kind of want to see if this happens. I mean, even if you're a skeptic, even if I was a skeptic, I would on Sunday morning be there and be like, okay, it's almost sunrise. Like, what's going to happen? Nobody was there. Nobody believed it would happen. And I think the big question is why? What was holding them back? And what's interesting is the thing that was holding them back from believing the miraculous empty tomb is the same thing that holds us back today. It's our fears, our hurts, and our doubts. And so what's amazing is as Jesus rises from the tomb and it is empty, watch what he does next. Right after he rises from the tomb, uh, as Brady just read, the disciples run back to Jerusalem, but Mary stays at the tomb. In verse 11, it says this. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look in the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was a gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned toward him and she cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means my teacher. The first thing that Jesus teaches us is this, as he rises from the dead, the very first thing he teaches us is that Jesus can heal our hurts. 
You see, imagine what Mary went through. Mary was one of the few people brave enough to sit at the foot of the cross and watch Jesus die. She was there. She watched him beaten. We talked about this on Friday, that he was marred beyond human likeness. Someone you love and care about, to see them go through that, to have a crown of thorns shoved in, to have a spear, to be beaten beyond any likeness. She's crushed. I mean, I can't imagine what she was going through. And so she just goes back to the tomb. She just stays there until Jesus shows up. And for you today, some of you, this is you. You are hurting. And what you need to take from Mary is this. Sometimes you just need to stay until Jesus shows up. You see, she's looking for a body. She's looking for a body because she cannot possibly comprehend what God is capable of. And for some of you today that are hurting, that is you. You are hurting and you are going, God, if you would just do this. And you have no idea what he is truly capable of is so much more. And I think what's interesting about Mary is this, that when we are hurting and we are grieving, we can be so consumed by our loss and our grief that the Lord can be right there and we miss him. Or we can be so busy with the tasks that we have to do. Because what is she doing there? She's coming to rewrap the body because the guys wrapped him the night before. And if you know anything about women, um, if you're married, you know, they got to come back and do things right. You know, like that's just how the men did not wrap it right. They're coming back. They got to fix it. I, I never do the dishwasher right. I know that. I don't put the sheets on the bed the right way. I, it just, it happens. And so she's coming to get things right because she's still expecting a body to be there. And that can be us. We can either be so consumed with our grief that we miss it, or we can be so overwhelmed by the task to keep busy and do things that we miss that Jesus is right in front of us. And Jesus comes to her to take that burden off her. And so if you are here today and you are hurting or you are grieved or you are burdened or you are frustrated or you are exhausted or you are overwhelmed, what Jesus is trying to invite you to is this, that the tomb is empty and that means that anything is possible. That means whatever you are hurting with, he can heal. And he is still scheduling meetings today. And so you might be saying, well, I'm hurting. How how does he heal that? Because there's an empty tomb. Because no matter what you are hurting from, there is a day where you will never be hurting from it again. He has proven that to you by the empty tomb. That no matter what grief or loss you have, that there will be a day that you will be reconciled again. There will be a day where you will see them again, that this is not our end, that we will live forever. That no matter what pain, no matter what sorrow, that there will be a day where every tear will be wiped away and there will be no more pain, no more sorrow forever. And he can prove that because there is an empty tomb. And he rose from the dead. It's not over. Your hurts can be healed. The second thing that he teaches us is what comes next. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them. Notice, it doesn't say he knocked on the door and then like walked in. Jesus literally just in the middle of the room, just boom. Like, can you imagine the terror? Like we read that and we're like, oh, how nice, like Jesus showed up. Like, can you imagine just being here and all of a sudden like, boom, a dude just appeared right in the middle of the room. You know, like that would freak me out. I would jump. I don't know about you. And then I love this. He says, peace be with you. You know, like, I just, I wonder the context of that. You know, was it like, peace be with you? Or did he like, as he appeared, like, peace be with you? You know, like if I was Jesus, I would have done that. But he comes into the room and he says, peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. The second thing that he's teaching us after his resurrection is this, Jesus can fix our fears. Jesus can fix our fears. You see, why they were afraid was this. It was the Roman government that executed Jesus. And the Jewish leaders, they said, look, they keep talking about he's gonna rise from the dead. You need to guard that body because they're gonna try and steal that body and then say he rose from the dead. And so the Roman government's like, okay, fine. And so they put him in the tomb. They put this huge rock over the tomb that nobody, single person can move. And they actually sealed it with the, the insignia, with the seal of Rome that is punishable by death, that if you break it, it is punishable by death. And they actually put Roman centurions, Roman guards out in front of the tomb. And so all of a sudden when they show up and nobody's there and there's open, 
open tomb and there's no body, they're terrified. The disciples are thinking, everybody's going to think we did this. The Roman government is going to come after us. They're going to think we did this. And so they're in hiding and they're afraid and they're, they're realizing that, oh my goodness, we're, like, we're going to have all of Rome coming after us. And then all of a sudden, in all of that fear, Jesus comes in the middle of it miraculously. I mean, can you imagine how happy they were? Not only are they like, Jesus, you're alive, but they're like, we're not going to get arrested and killed. Yes. You know, like this is a big moment for them. And the thing is, is that God is still showing up in miraculous ways today. Because the incredible thing that he does with fear, the way that he fixes it is exactly what he said there. He brings peace. The Bible says that Jesus can bring peace that surpasses all understanding. That through the supernatural power of God, that as you give your fear over to him, that you can stand in that fear and there's no explainable reason why, but you can find peace. Even though everything is still the way it was, you can find peace and not fear. And peace is something you cannot find anywhere else. You cannot buy it at Costco. You cannot pop a pill because then you will need to pop another pill. You can try to have another drink, but then you'll need another drink. You, you can't just ignore what's going on in the fear in your life. You can't just hope it goes away. You can't just accept it. Nothing fixes fear but Jesus. And he brings peace. And so if you're struggling with fear today, if you have a laundry list of things, if I am fearful of this and this could happen to me and this could happen and this is going on and this is gonna happen, Jesus says, bring it to me. Bring it to me. And in miraculous ways, I can show up in your life and I can bring you peace that surpasses all understanding. And the third thing that he teaches us is this. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, was one of the 12. He was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came again and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put your hand into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. The third thing that Jesus does is this. He can defeat our doubts. Imagine this, the 10 disciples are sitting there, they see Jesus, and Thomas isn't there. He, was spent, he spent the last three years with these guys. And they say, Jesus is alive, and he looks at them and says, you're liars. Can you imagine that? He looks at them and goes, you're a bunch of liars. There's no way I would believe this unless I can touch him and feel him and put my finger in his wound. I'm not going to believe it. And some of you today, that's you. you. You are the doubters. You are the skeptics that you see these stories and unless you can look at it under a microscope or unless you have this type of evidence, unless somebody proves it to you, unless you see it for yourself, some of you are raising those kids right now. God help you or you're married to one. Good luck. Um, but you, you, that's Thomas is you need to prove it to me. And it says in the text that Jesus waits some days. I love that. Jesus is like, okay. Mr. Bossy, I'll do this on my time in my place. And he waits a couple days. And you gotta imagine Thomas is probably feeling a little proud of himself right now, right? They're like, Jesus is here. And he's like, yeah, prove it. And then like days go by. And you imagine like Thomas is probably like, yeah, where's Jesus, huh? Where is he? And all of a sudden they gather together and boom, Jesus appears. And I wonder what that initial emotion of Thomas was. Do you think it was joy? Like, oh, he is alive. Or do you think it was like, oh, I'm in trouble. Like, I don't know. But, but for whatever reason, he's standing there and Jesus appears. And what's incredible is this. Jesus says, okay, Thomas, touch. Put your finger in. And you know what? The text doesn't say that he actually touches. The text says that his initial reaction is, my Lord, my God. You're mine. You have proven it to me. I have seen it with my own eyes. And see, that's the incredible thing about Jesus is there will be a day that he proves himself to all the doubters. 
And it will either be in this life or the life to come that you will stand before him and he will prove to all the doubters what he has been saying all along. But the thing about Thomas is this, you have to be looking to see it. If you have your doubts, you still need to take them to the Lord. You still need to seek. You still need to ask. And Jesus promises to meet you in that doubt, to fix that doubt. But there's one big thing I want you to notice about this, these three stories that we see after Jesus' resurrection. Notice this. Each person in each story processes Jesus' death differently. Everyone handles pain and grief differently. Mary has to be with the body. She can't let go. She can't leave that space. We see that all the time. The, the person that goes through something terrible and they just, they can't leave the person's side. They have to be there. Or the, the traffic scene, you know, they have to stay there and put the flowers and they can't leave. They just cannot let go. That's how she processes. And the disciples, they process together. We're gonna gather together and we're gonna be, uh, con console each other together. And then Thomas, he, he goes to isolation. That's his mode. In trouble and pain and crisis, everyone processes differently. And everyone processes their hurts and their fears and their doubts differently too. And here's what is so awesome, is which one does Jesus show up to? All of them. All of them. He shows up to each one of them and meets them exactly where they are at and gives them exactly what they need. And I can testify to you this. In my life, Jesus has done this countless times. In my life, I can tell you the stories of when Jesus met me exactly where I was at and he healed my hurts and, and he, he fixed my fears and he destroyed my doubts. He took care of what was separating me from him countless times. And that's what we celebrate this Easter is that that's what Jesus accomplished on the cross and that's what he accomplished through the empty grave in his resurrection is Jesus took care of everything that is separating us from him and that is our sin. If you're a guest here today, buckle up. You're gonna hear this and it's the truth. You are a sinner. And maybe you disagree with that, but that's okay. I'm a sinner, you're a sinner. The person next to you is definitely a sinner. All of us are sinners, we all sin. And what sin means is this. Sin is when you do not honor the glory of God, when you do not revere the holiness of God, when you do not admire the greatness of God, when you do not praise the power of God, when you do not seek the, the truth of God or esteem the wisdom of God, when you do not treasure the beauty of God or savor the goodness of God. It's when you do not trust the faithfulness of God or, or when you do not obey the commandments of God when the justice of God is not respected or when the wrath of God is not feared, when, when the grace of God is not cherished, when the presence of God is not prized, and most of all, when the person of God is not loved, all of that is sin and every single one of us is guilty of that. And our sin makes us unworthy to stand before a holy and righteous God on our last day. And so unable to save ourselves, Jesus came and he rescued us. He took our debt upon himself. He took the wrath that we deserve and he died on the cross to set us all free. He paid the debt that we could never pay. And so whatever is keeping you from Jesus, whether it be your hurts or your fears or your doubts, Jesus is ready to meet you now. And this is the good news that I get to preach to you this day and every day this Easter is that there is an empty tomb. So I don't care what it is in your life. I don't care what's going on. I don't know what deep hurts or I don't know what big doubts and I don't know what massive fears you have, but it doesn't matter what they are because the tomb is empty. So anything is possible. Anything is possible. And Jesus can heal it all. He is risen. He is risen indeed, Alleluia. All things are possible because there's an empty tomb. All praise and glory be to our Lord Jesus Christ and all God's people said, amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today and Lord, we confess that there are many times where we are hurting and we doubt your goodness we stop trusting you. 
Lord, I pray that you would heal our hurts and forgive us for for doing that. Lord, there are many of us here today that, that struggle with our fear. We look at the massive things around us and, and we focus on them instead of focusing on you. And Lord, I pray that you would help us, that you would fix our fears, that we would see that there is nothing that we should fear because there is an empty tomb. All things will be taken care of. Forgive us for letting our fears overwhelm us. And Lord, forgive us for our doubts. There are so many times where if we don't get the exact explanation we want or if there are things that you leave a mystery, then we hold it against you. Lord, we pray that you would allow us to trust you without all the answers and that we would wait patiently and keep seeking when we do not understand. Forgive us for when we haven't done that. Lord, all of these things we lift up in the name of your son, Jesus, who did not spare anything to save us and to rescue us and bring us back home, who took on our debt and our sin to set us free and to bring us salvation. Lord, it is in his name that we pray and ask for forgiveness. And all God's people said, amen.